The History Things Podcast is brought to you by TR Historical, your one-stop shop for all your historical fan gear needs. Visit trhistorical.com and use the promo code HISTORYTHINGS to receive 10% off your next purchase. Thanks for listening. Now let's start the show. is my co-host, the man of the hour, Pat McGuire. Pat, how's it going, buddy? It's going awesome, dude. I am excited to be back, talk about uh, women in the arsenals again. We've been having a great year. It's, it's really awesome to wrap up on this note, so uh, really excited to get just into the, into the groovy stuff, you know? Absolutely. And Pat, as he implied, this is our Q4, our quarter four follow-up episode with Raina Egan, and she's joined us again to cover some of those questions from the public, from you guys, our listeners, and a few things we wanted to touch on uh, following our last episode. So, Raina, how are you? Oh, not too bad. How are you guys? We're doing great. Like we said, this is going to be a lot of fun. So, why don't we kick things off? Pat, take it away with our first question that we had. Come on in. All right. So, our first question comes from Mike in Fresno, California. So, flying in from the West Coast, (laughs) catching a little bit of jet lag. Um, So, he asks, the series of explosions that ripped through the Allegheny Arsenal are thought to have been caused by a horseshoe or perhaps a wagon wheel striking a spark which ignited the accumulated powder near the Arsenal Laboratory. With these explosions taking place at a government facility, Mike wants to know what was the military's response to the explosion and what happens to Colonel John Symington, uh, who's in command of the Arsenal complex? So I guess he's looking for you know a little bit of accountability here. Uh, Well, as I talked about in the first episode, there was the local coroner's inquest, which of course ruled uh, Symington and his officers as guilty of negligence. And after this, he demanded that a military court of inquiry be held. And that happens on October the 15th, roughly a month after the explosion. And you had most of the same witnesses as you had at the coroner's inquest, and you had a lot of the victims' families present. And the wagon driver, whose wagon or horse might have touched off the spark that set off the explosions, uh, J.R. Frick, he was even more adamant that the barrels of powder that he'd been shipping around to the various buildings were leaky and that he had been the one to see the spark. And in response to this, Symington brings in witnesses to try to discredit his testimony because he was accused of uh, some uh, less than satisfactory uh, work conduct. So Symington basically tried to poke holes in his arguments for that reason. And so uh, after seven days of the court of inquiry, uh, they ruled that the verdict could not be satisfactorily ascertained. Basically, we don't know what happened. Hmm. Gotcha. And one of the uh, things that they uh, theorized was you know, good old-fashioned victim blaming. They blamed uh, Frick's helper, Robert Smith, for jumping up onto the barrels and somehow igniting the powder, powder that way. This is not a and, new phenomenon for people to be pointing fingers at each other when there's massive amounts of blame to be going around. <laughs> yeah, very true. Breaking news. Nobody wants to accept responsibility. <laughs> and also, uh, they posited that static electricity might have also caused it because 
the officer said that the women working there had refused to wear moccasins, you know, shoes that didn't have any nails or plates or anything in them, as a lot of period shoes did. And these were the type of shoes that the boys who would be handling artillery shells there would be wearing. And again, you know, victim blaming. That's, I mean, I remember us discussing the uh, court of inquiry, but that's, that's great. I didn't realize that they had that much information about it. No, the shoes and everything else they were looking into. That's pretty wild. That's like some CSI forensics. They were like, you know, getting into the materials of, you know, source materials. It's like, this is an accelerant. <laughs> there you go. I feel like David Caruso just, and then the who, and it just, it all steamrolls into a civil war CSI episode. <laughs> Well, actually, they did do something like that a few years ago at Heinz History Center, basically, you know, CSI Civil War, where there was a public event going on where people would uh, kind of play act as some of the figures from the explosion, and they would try to figure out what had happened. And from what I understand, they reached pretty much the same conclusion that had been caused by either the wagon wheel or horses shoe setting it off. I love that kind of interactive history. There, the battlefield locally here used to do something similar to that. You might remember, Matt, once mm-hmm. upon a time, they used to hand out these like haversacks to people that were on the tours. And inside each haversack, there was like a, a, a character or a person from the battle and like a little bit about them and where they were from. And every time I would go, I'd always get Bradley P. Johnson. And I was <laughs> like, this has got to be the only guy you got because this is a battle in Frederick and he's from Frederick. But what I always liked about it was um, at the end of the tour, they would kind of, you know, ask everyone their thoughts on like what they might have done differently. Like if you were Bradley, you know, Johnson, what sort of actions might you have done differently with your cavalry ahead of Monocacy Junction? So it sounds like that's a really similar thing you guys were doing up there with the Allegheny Arsenal explosion, which is super neat. Uh, Raina, our second question actually came out of uh, my former home state of Michigan. This is uh, Shannon. She's asking, was there a danger to surrounding structures near the arsenal? as a result of the explosions? And if so, what did the citizens of Lawrenceville do to bring the fires of these explosions under control? Uh, So from what I've seen, there didn't seem to be too much damage aside from some shattered windows in nearby houses and buildings. The damage was largely kept to the arsenal grounds, but there was debris and even body parts that went as far as the Allegheny River. Wow. As to pointing out the fire, uh, the arsenal had their own fire engine. They brought it up, and there was a little pond that used to be in front of where the magazine was, and they used that, and they also formed sort of a Bucket brigade, you know. Bucket brigade! Buckets down the line to each other. Yeah, I have a lot of firefighters in my family, and when you, when I got into the research for how they sort of manage the after-explosion chaos, it was interesting to see how organized Pittsburgh actually was as far of it as its, you know, private fire company is worth because in addition to the arsenal having its own they did end up you know utilizing the bucket brigade but um we did find a couple instances of like three or four independent fire companies making their way up there and helping and it was you know uh, a new york based family i guess where we study hmm. uh, a lot of the tammany era fire companies the famous scene in gangs of new york where the firemen show up and end up beating the crap out of each other right. is more of a reality than some people would like to admit and it was nice to see that there was some organization even amongst rival companies in Pittsburgh that like, this has got to get put out more importantly than any sort of competitive nature they might have. So I thought that was really cool in the management um, of the, of the, the explosion itself. So um, the next question actually comes from me because I think this is a, uh, the answer to this when I looked into it, it was one of the cooler things I always like to highlight this particular group of folks. So the, the women that worked uh, at the Allegheny Arsenal, Raina, they spent the majority of their labor hours manufacturing small arms cartridges. So like mini balls, buck and ball rounds, things like that uh, for the Union war effort. Who specifically were these munitions being produced for? Were these just troops from Pittsburgh, troops from Pennsylvania only? 
the overall union war effort um, or were these for, you know, troops in the Eastern theater or the Western theater uh, as far as, you know, receiving these munitions? Uh, from what I've seen, the majority of the arms and everything made there went to uh, both points and armies outside of both the Pittsburgh and uh, Pennsylvania area, including a good many to the Western Theater. I couldn't really find uh, any specific units um, where these might have gone. And at least uh, early on in the war, when units were being raised in and around Pittsburgh, uh, they were made for uh, the various camps that were being set up, including Camp Wright, Camp Wilkins, Camp Scott, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, actually, right before the war began, uh, right as South Carolina was seceding in December of 1860, uh, Symington had received orders to uh, ship uh, supplies and such uh, to forts and points south. And uh, this created a lot of public outcry. Mm. And so much so that the order was. Uh, eventually rescinded, but the damage had already been done to uh, Symington and his reputation. And uh, coming back to the first question, since I didn't get to what happened to Symington himself, uh, when the war began, he was already in his 60s and not the greatest of health. And what's telling is a few weeks before the arsenal explosion, he actually asked to retire, but uh, this was denied. And so uh, November, after the explosion, he was relieved and replaced by Major Robert Henry Kirkwood. So Symington ended up taking sick leave, and then he ended up dying in April of 1864 in Hartford County, Maryland, at the age of 67. Wow. With the, um, a little bit of a follow-up on that one, Raina, with, uh, you said Symington had been ordered to ship mus munitions south prior to the war. Uh, about what time was that? Is that right before the war? Is that in the winter of 60, 61, uh, when John Floyd was still Secretary of War? Yeah, Floyd had been the one to issue the orders, and this <laughs> would have been in... December of 1860. That's like figures. Yeah. Sounds just like John Floyd. Yeah, no, mm. I, I've, I'm doing some of my own research on Floyd, and that that really hits home and, and lines up with what I'm finding as well. So, yeah, excellent, excellent. <laughs> Um, now, Pat asked one of his. I want to do a, a, a one of mine as well. Uh, we'd talked about in the initial interview the Heinz Corporation, uh, purchasing some of the buildings on the Arsenal grounds after it was shut down. Do you know of any other modern company connections to the Allegheny Arsenal that our listeners might recognize? Well, of course, the much of the land where the Arsenal once stood is now what's called Arsenal Park. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have the playground and the ball field. And uh, I don't know so much that this has been going on lately, but they've been holding a uh, festivals and farmers markets and such there but uh there's also the upper grounds of the arsenal that were closer to the allegheny river and now you have a lot of modern developments including the uh arsenal 201 uh apartment complexes that were beginning to be built a few years back that's where they started up dig started digging up uh cannonballs again Huh. That's where that comes from. And also in that area, there's a Rite Aid, there's a Western Union, uh, there's Arsenal Middle School. That's where the one bronze plaque to the victims initially was. Uh, I guess, no, it's still there. Uh, and also there is a UPMC St. Margaret Lawrenceville. And for those of you outside of the area, that's University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which is the biggest uh, hospital system and medical provider in, well, much of the state, really. Mm. 
So Lawrenceville really took that Arsenal name and, and uh, identification and ran with it, it sounds like, for a bunch of their other businesses and, and later um, municipalities and parks and rec, that sort of thing. I had read something about the DuPont Corporation or what is the modern DuPont Corporation being tied into maybe some of the shipping of uh, the black powder and, and whatnot. I was just curious if any of your research had uh, had had come across that. Yeah, the majority of the black powder use at the arsenal did come from DuPont. Ah. And uh, the barrels that I had mentioned, uh, they were uh, used and reused and reused, of course, until the lids no longer fit tightly. Hmm. And uh, Alexander McBride, the uh, superintendent of the lab, had uh, tried complaining to Symington and complaining to DuPont, but of course uh, his concerns were waved off because, you know, we have a war, we need to keep things moving. Right. I feel like there's also like thinking like in my mind, like the way the Sultana played out where there's some like negligence sort of willfully for the sake of making a dollar or a dime or a buck, whatever the equivalent of the modern phrase, you know, making a buck would be like, you know, Research. I wonder how much research, you know, would yield evidence that there was sort of a willfulness to reuse these older barrels and things because it was saving money, quote unquote, but it was really just a way to keep money going in places like, you know, people's pockets, stuff like that. There was a lot of profiteering that took place during the war and honestly in all wars, uh, industry profits, things like that. Um, I just, uh, from my own own knowledge, just to sort of follow up on, on like last, like, you know, questions from the hosts, I guess, was uh, before we continue with listener questions was, uh, you know, after this explosion, there's obviously an immediate aftermath where not a lot other than recovery and assessment is taking place. But after the explosion, like, is this it for the war for production for the arsenal? Like, are they just offline throughout the rest of the American Civil War? Or is there a moment where they're, you know, they're back to work, you know, amongst the rubble or amongst a rebuilt arsenal? Like, is that the end of the story after the blast, or, or do they, they get back to business? Oh, no, they get right back to business within a couple of days. Oh, wow, um, wow. Even as they're continuing to work, there's workmen uh, sent to clear away the debris of the lab and to salvage whatever they can. Hmm. But otherwise, they pretty much uh, keep on trucking for the rest of the war. Yeah, I got to, I suppose. Wow. All right. Uh, our next listener question comes from Greg down in Front Royal, Virginia. And Greg wants to know, um, how did the Allegheny Arsenal end up settling on a workforce of uh, young women uh, at the time of the battle? Considering that, like, as opposed to the Confederacy, where they were operating in more of an all-hands-on-deck kind of situation, mm-hmm. there was a lot of men of fighting age, of work production age, manufacturing age, that were not off on the front lines. Um, you know, is there, is there a reason why earlier in the war, the arsenal decided to go this route of employment to have a a significant number of young women, uh, uh, producing, you know, these munitions other than to say having a traditional male workforce like they had in peacetime? Uh, it's like I said in the first episode, uh, with, uh, more production increasing and more ammunition and such needed, they turned to a more female workforce uh, for various reasons. Probably the main one was that uh, women could be paid less than male workers. Good point. Yeah, real good point. Raina, we're going to wrap it up with a question that we actually got quite a few um, folks asking about. And I'd like you to share not only potential um, answers for this, but also your social media again, because I think a lot of this will be able to help them out. But what resources do you recommend for folks who might be interested in learning more about the arsenal explosions and or the people who worked in these facilities? Uh, I have a few good resources. Uh, this one I think is out of print, but you can find in a lot of libraries. It's uh, Pittsburgh During the American Civil War by Arthur Fox. It's a good resource for uh, Pittsburgh and the war effort in general. And, of course, it focuses a good bit on everything to do with the Allegheny Arsenal. And there's also a little local history uh, written by 
probably the authority on the Allegheny Arsenal. Uh, it's called Pittsburgh's Al Forgotten Allegheny Arsenal by James Wodarczyk. Uh, he's actually written a good number of books and articles and such on that. And uh, for more on um, the focus of the women working there, uh, there's a chapter or two talking about women at both Allegheny Arsenal and Washington Arsenal plus uh, Watertown Arsenal up in Massachusetts. Oh, it covers a lot of ground. Yeah, it's uh, Army at Home, Women in the Civil War on the Northern Home Front by Judy Giesberg. Uh, it's a wonderful book about women on the home front in general that focuses a good deal on women in arsenals. Um, about the Washington Arsenal explosion, there's the Washington Arsenal explosion, Civil War disaster in the Capitol by Brian Bergen. It was actually published uh, not too long after he passed away a few years ago by his daughter, Erin. Mm. It's a really good one. And uh, there is also a book about women and girls working in the arsenals. Uh, it's sort of more uh, for a young adult audience, but really it's it's useful for anyone. Uh, Gunpowder Girls, the true stories of three Civil War tragedies by Tanya Anderson. All right. Well, before we before we wrap things up and get out of here, let me ask you one more question. This uh, this we actually have one more question from our listeners. Uh, this comes from Sarah in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, and uh, I actually really like her question because I, I like human interest things, and we'll this will be you know kind of fitting and proper to end our episode here with a, a sort of more human. Uh, element to this. So as far as I understand it, we only have one known photograph of any of the victims of the explosion. Um, and that is of uh, Frederica Neckerman. And Sarah wants to know, based on your research, what can you tell us about her um, other than she passed away in the explosion? Right. Uh, well, I wish I could take credit for the research for this, but um, <laughs> Her name was actually uh, Fridolina Neckerman, but she's oh. uh, cited as Melinda in a lot of uh, news accounts, probably just uh, getting her name wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but the photograph uh, came to light about two years ago, and there's an article online from the Lawrenceville Historical Society by Tom Powers called Face of a Tragedy. Um, all about her. She had uh, been working in room one of the lab, which was the closest to the explosion. She was actually the daughter of Michael Neckerman, who was the Arsenal's master mechanic. Uh, before the war, he had actually been an assistant to Thomas Rodman up at Watertown Arsenal before transferring back to Allegheny. And uh, later in his life, about 1890, he was interviewed for an article in the Pittsburgh Dispatch about his time there. And uh, census records show that uh, Frida Lena, or Lena, as apparently she was going by in the 1860 census, uh, was the oldest of three children at that time, a uh, sister and a brother. And they lived on 39th Street, which was right across from the officers' quarters that were built shortly after the war. And the tintype, as well as uh, Michael's diary, uh, came to light. They are both in the possession of the several times great, it would be several times great nephew of Fridolina. Uh, and these uh, came to light on Ancestry. And the diary that uh, Michael kept was translated from German. So apparently he was still speaking German fairly late in life uh, by his grandson around the time that he was interviewed for the newspaper. And he had written that uh, his daughter's hand was severed and was identified by an engagement ring that was on there. Oof. 
And he was buried at a uh, Allegheny Cemetery, uh, most likely in the mass grave as an unknown. And her fiance, uh, William Corning, he had been a saddler by trade, and apparently in his grief, he went and joined the Union Army, where he ended up dying in battle somewhere in Virginia. I meant to uh, find out where. What was his name? William Corning, K-O-R-N-I-N-G. Do you have any of his unit information by any chance, like... Or have you not gotten that far in the investigation of who he was? I had meant to look that up, and I just haven't gotten that far yet, but I plan to try to track him down. Well, cool. If we can be of help, we would love to do that. Awesome. Well, you know, this has been an awesome time having you back here. Uh, I thought this was a really great topic. You know, we wanted to, uh, you know, like we were saying in the first episode, we wanted to elevate a voice, elevate a conversation that, you know, not a lot of people were having. And Obviously, the Allegheny Arsenal explosion is something that is known, but the the conversation about the workforce um, that was impacted so immensely by the explosion right. the, is not so uh, talked about. So we were excited to have you on. We were excited to have you back. Um, and, and we really thank you for getting into these questions with us because we had a lot of people who were really excited about the story and, and wanted to know. Um, Raina, could you give us, uh, for our listeners, one more time, your social media contacts so if folks do want to reach out to you or follow you on Instagram, they can. On Instagram, my handle is Raina.g.egan. And on Facebook, uh, I don't know the URL offhand, but if you search <laughs> for In the Midst of Youth and Beauty, that'll pull up my page there. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm saying I'm all about people, you know, going on adventures and, and social media is a great way for, for everyone to follow along with your adventure, you know, in your research, on your way towards uh, publication, because, um, you know, as we talked about, that can be an up and down odyssey. And oh, yeah. obviously, you know, as well as I do and, and Matt does that it's it's a ride. Mm-hmm. So uh, so it's very cool. So, Raina, um, Matt, is there anything you wanted to touch on before we get out of here? No, again, just thank you for coming back on, Raina, and and doing these follow-up questions. I know everybody's got a tight schedule, so it's always kind of fun to schedule these. But uh, we do appreciate you coming back and talking to us again. And please do keep us in the loop in regards to not only your further research, but also your work with getting um, your research published, because we would love to promote that for when that does happen, because it will happen, I promise. (laughs) Absolutely. So uh, any final thoughts, any parting words, Raina? Uh, just, I appreciate you guys having me again. Very awesome. Well, Absolutely. Uh, for everyone listening to the History of Things podcast, uh, for my host, uh, Matt Borders, I'm Pat McGuire. This is the History of Things podcast saying see you next time. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show.